Okay, hey, today in this video, I am going to cover some of the highlights of what I look for in LiDAR data processing software. I know, you know, in the market today, it can be very confusing on what is good, what is bad, with DJI coming out with its software, uh, and folks really not being familiar with this technology, but being told that they need it, you know, maybe it's time to actually go through and step through the, the, the actual workflows and what works and why you should have it. I've been doing this for eight years, guys. So, you know, when we first started with this, we had a whole bunch of other little um, individual components. And we had to kind of fuse those together into different software to make it work. Nowadays, it's not quite like that. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a longer video, stay to the end, because I'm going to show you a couple things at the end as a kind of a bonus. Uh, you know, this is high quality content, uh, so I, and I hope you feel that way in here. Now, with a disclaimer, I represent multitudes of LiDAR vendors right now. Um, and so I'm going to show you on one particular piece of software, but by no shape or means is this the only software out there that does this. I'm just using this as a way of highlighting some of the attributes that I like and some of the attributes that maybe I don't like uh, or things that I would like to see moving forward. And I know that some of the vendors that we work with are going to look at this and go, I need to copy this and I need to copy that. Uh, and that's good because the whole ecosystem will move up. So with that, let's jump into this and I'll show you the steps and the things that are important to me. Uh, and I hope you find this as high value. Let's go. Okay, hey, before we get started, I want to kind of give you a quick outline of what we're going to cover. I'm going to cover a lot of material here, folks. So in this video, I'm going to quickly go into, well, not quickly, I'm going to go into um, some of the, uh, just the overarching between different systems. Uh, so we'll spend a few minutes there, and then I'm going to actually start to get into visuals and start to show you software. Uh, so if you can stick around to somewhere around about the seventh minute, or fast forward, I don't care, uh, you're going to actually start to see some of the highlights. So I'm going to cover some of the basic stuff up front, but if this is boring to you, fine. Skip up to the, about the seven minute mark uh, where I actually start to show you in depth on the software piece. All right, let's get going here. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about is to cloud or not to cloud. Do you want a service that is on your desktop or do you want a service in the cloud? And so I, you know, when I'm talking with my clients, I make a recommendation uh, to at least own your software on your desktop. If you want to go to a cloud-based solution, that is fine. Why? Let's talk about some pros and cons here. So the first thing we want to talk about is, you know, processing the cloud allows us to leverage uh, excess processing capability. So if you don't have a strong computer, um, not that LiDAR is exactly data dense, it's actually very easy to process, but if you're in some of the higher end um, systems like the Pandars or the high-end Regals where you're getting millions of points per second, then you're going to absolutely want to have a, a machine that has multiple cores, RAM on it, and maybe even a potentially a good GPU, depending on you know, how that system or how that LiDAR software uses your hardware to get the job done. Uh, but I've done it on the you know, for certain software and certain uh, computers, I have done it on a rinky dinky uh, laptop. No Alienware or high end gaming computer uh, was included. So, LiDAR, just so you guys know, is a little different than photogrammetry. It doesn't have the same processing requirements. With that said, if you're going to colorize, you may need some more. Okay, so that's the first thing I look at in cloud to cloud. Uh, the next thing, you know, you're going to want to look at is, you know, bandwidth. So, you know, out in the field or something like that. If you're one of these guys that are in a time crunch, uh, having it on your tablet is going to, or not tablet, laptop, is going to be very beneficial for you uh, for, so that you can actually look at what your data looks like, uh, whether you have an auto sampling session, a streaming session, or, or you're gonna process in the field to take a look at it really quickly, or you're in your truck like some of our guys do, uh, and they let it run while they're driving down the road back from their job site. It's, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Okay, the other part of bandwidth is if you're gonna be using a cloud solution, remember you've gotta push all that data up in there. So if you're familiar with drone deploy, you know how long that may take uh, on there as well. So just be aware that if you're collecting a lot of data, like some of our clients will have you know, 15 or 20 flights in a day. 
you got to push all that up before you actually start your process flows. The other thing, though, is nice about cloud-based is that you may not have to know as much. Um, but then again, if you don't know as much, you don't know what quality that you're actually getting. And for those of you that have taken my courses, you realize that you really do want to control your data, understand how it's made so that you can QC. And when you sit down with your customer, you know how it's been made to explain certain things that may be happening in your data set. All right. Um, another thing is ownership. Okay. So that's why I really support desktop first. Um, if that cloud-based system goes out of business, has an error or a fault, uh, if you have a desktop solution, you always have a way forward. If you go solely with the cloud, you may end up with a, with a paperweight or if it not, is not supported or what have you. So you really want to protect your investment. You want to protect your business by having desktop software. All right. You know, and then the last thing about all of these, whether it's a desktop or a cloud base, is most of these are limited, which means, you know, if you guys are familiar with LIDAR in general, most of these folks encode their standards um, so that only their software will work. Uh, right now, there isn't an open standard uh, that's readily accepted, like with cameras and other systems, that allows us to go from or sample other third party software to get the job done. Um, you know, there's people trying, but it, it's a little bit tricky. You know, it's a little tricky between manufacturers and integrators, and it's tricky between sensor heads because of some of the optics and the way they interpret light to get your data done. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about here is getting actually into some software. So we're going to go take a look at LiGeo, and we're going to talk about workflow. Okay, this is thing now. I will be highlighting elements of the workflow. I'm not going to go show you specifically how to do certain things. I will cover it in this video right here um, when that actually pops up. So now if you want to really take a deep dive, you know, we are updating our data processing, um, LIDAR data processing course, and I'll put a link down in the bottom for that uh, when it becomes updated and available. It's something that you would like to do. So if you want to try on this software with real data and for us to walk you through step by step uh, so that you're familiar with this before you go and look at all the other systems out there, go ahead and try that. All right. With that said, let's go ahead and jump in here. Okay. So now with LiGeo here um, in particular, and again, there's lots of different uh, folks out there um, in the marketplace today. So this isn't the only way to do it. But what I like about it, and the first thing I look look for is a streamlined workflow. You know, I can give you some history here. Back in the day, we would literally have to open five or six pieces of software in sequential order to actually get LiDAR to work. You know, first thing we'd be doing is converting our base station data. Then we'd be opening another one to be uh, processing and correlating our telemetry, which is our base station, our GPS, and our IMU, so we can have the drone or the rover uh, precise locations in points of time. And then we would use a LiDAR compiler or processor that would join the, uh, the telemetry along with the LiDAR. And then we may open up another piece of software to colorize. So for all of you folks here, what we really want to see is, is um, some very streamlined workflows because you don't have the time to be jumping back and forth. And when you start to get into streamlined workflows, now we get into batch processing. Okay, so that's that's important here. All right, so now when we jump on here, the first thing I wanna be able to do, you know, and this is a, you know, Green Valley is set up very nicely in a tape format. Uh, you know, other, other guys will be using drop-down GIS type menus. That's okay, that works. Um, and others will have fully automated processes. Me personally, what I like to see, and I don't see it all even in Green Valley, is I want the easy button to get things done, and I want to be able to go into the back to look at reports and, and to assess quality when things go bad. And every system has things that go bad, okay? Um, so I like to see both of those. It allows me to feel very confident about the data that I am producing. And it allows me to share my standards with my clients, um, especially if things aren't going perfectly, so that you can show them 
either that we need to redo something or you can have an honest conversation on that. So, you know, this is me just being real with you guys, you know, unlike some of the folks on the market today. So the thing I want first to see here as we go into this is I want to be able to segment my data. Now, some systems allow you to draw boxes. That makes it easy unless you have a takeout point in the middle and you have to filter that out. Some will allow you to do segmentation uh, auto, which we can hit this, in this case, this auto split. I'll pull it up and we can set some parameters that will actually break these turns out. By the way, this data was actually captured with UGCS, so you can notice the, the smooth turns that allow some better data accuracy. And I covered that in other, other videos as well. Um, but the one I like to use, and we're gonna use the select trajectory, and if we're gonna pull this up, um, I'm gonna come in here and I'm just going to take the data that I want. Now I know some systems out there do auto clipping. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, you know, I used to, when I first started LiDAR, uh, try to, to limit the amount of data that I captured. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, I found that if I could control this, I had better awareness, and it only took me a couple seconds to do what we're doing here right now. So now that I have that, some systems will allow you then to edit the GPS time. Green Valley does not. Um, and why would I want to do that? In more advanced systems, I could actually look at the telemetry, see where I would see um, issues in my in my tracking where uh, my heading is going off in, in, in other videos. I talk about why heading is important. Uh, and then I could trim back or scale back my GPS time so that I didn't have that uh, in there skewing the accuracy of my data. Um, again, with these lower end systems, you don't really get to see that. But as a lighter professional that wants to make sure I get down to the millimeter uh, of precision, or I, let me rephrase that, capture as, as, as good as I can get down to a millimeter of um, error deference. So that's what I'm really trying to say here is I want as little error as, as possible. That's why I want to go into this and maybe do some trimming and clipping. Uh, but I've been doing this for eight years. Um, so now that I have that, you know, I know exactly the data that I want to have. So that will allow me to go into the next thing. And that goes into my settings. So I want to be able to come in. And again, I want this whole stream flow. So you can see the tapes here. Uh, but I'm going to go into my settings here that allow this to happen. Um, and I'm not worried about laser settings. That's kind of fluff for other systems on here. Uh, for, for colorization, yeah, I want to make sure I have a shot record here. I'm not going to go much into colorization other than I like to have it for identification. I'm not a fan of colorization as a lighter standpoint, but it's a nice to have for marketing purposes and maybe to ascertain certain uh, quality controls for my classification types. Um, so it's nice to have. And with this type of system here, being able to do to shoot out a telemetry file yeah, with my with my images to pix 4D allows me to do photogrammetry in addition to my LiDAR. So that's nice. Um, but we get into positioning or telemetry, you know, it changes. Um, the Lie Geo is nice in that across their whole entire product line, they have Novatel systems, they have Postpack coming in. So they have this even spread to support all their uh, software in one package. It's not like certain manufacturers we used to deal with that um, they're, they're literally doing piecemeal to their code as they come out with a different variance. Uh, this is all pretty standardized. Um, you know, and you'll see this in other uh, top-end uh, LiDAR manufacturers as well. Uh, probably the biggest thing is, you know, how you're going to pull your base station data in. Um, you know, the, the Rhinex is, is really the standard, which nice here is they allow us multiple standards, whether they're RTCM 2, 3, excuse me, uh, a Rhinex, um, or they have their own base as well. So there's multiple ways you can bring data in. Again, for most systems, Rhinex is going to be the way to go. Um, and just be careful on the survey systems, even though they may work, um, certain, especially the ones with the Ooblocks and the low end systems, uh, are, are hit and miss on their accuracy over time. The other piece here though, when you get into base station correction is being able to be very precise about the location. Um, some systems allow, have that in the header data. Some of it, you know, do an average. I don't recommend that. 
But being manual and being able to pull an opus or a, a accuracy report in for that location is critical. Um, most systems are going to put it in WSG84, which brings me to the next topic. I'm going to move forward here is I like systems that will put out orthometric height and projections. Some systems, um, especially most of the international folks, will put out maybe projection corrections, but do not take into account um, geoids and orthometric heights. And so you really want to be able to pull that in um, in there. And I think in other, other videos like this one, I cover a little bit how you would convert that uh, if you're going to be in there, but why add that to a workflow? You know, what you want to be able to do is spit that out in the correct projection because you're going to have to make corrections to it anyways, and you don't want to be doing a transformation from a lipsoidal to a, a orthometric uh, vertical datum type of transform. You're going to lose accuracy, and then you're going to have to do more work to get it right. So it's better to get it right up front, and frankly, it's cheaper when you look at processing power. Um, so this one actually is classification. I'll talk more about that. And there's smoothing, um, which I'll talk a little bit about that here in the next topic. Okay. So the next thing we look at here, you know, is the data processing quick disclosure. Uh, I forgot that this data set that we were working on didn't have imagery. So I'm going to throw a couple clips in so you can see what, uh, colorized ladder would look like inside of this process. Um, I don't like sleight of hand, so <laughs> I just want to explain why I'm showing you some other images in here um, and then we'll move on with the regular workflow uh, about that. So with that said, go into that. Okay, and the last thing that I look for in this workflow type of setup when I'm doing just routine data processing is when I come out here to file, you know, being able to set up a batch process where I can actually control. So why is this important is a lot of you guys are going to be covering somewhere between 40 and 80 acres per flight. And, and a lot of our clients are doing about 200 to 400 acres on average, but our highly uh, motivated folks are doing, you know, projects that are up to like 3000 acres. That's a lot of time to be sitting in front of a computer. So another thing that I like to have is to be able to batch process. Uh, I think that's very important to save you guys some time and it's a good feature to have. And that you can do that. Um, now, if you're talented, you can write your own scripts, <laughs> but who has time for that? All right. So now that we have that done, so the next thing we're going to talk about is data conditioning. So in the last topic or section we talked about was actual data processing. Folks, most most processing um, LIDAR systems out there do that and do that germanely. But if you want to talk about how to get the most out of uh, a LIDAR system, now is talking about data conditioning. Um, so again, a lot of manufacturers and integrators will allow or rely on TerraSolids, LiDAR 360, um, uh, TopoDot, and some of these other um, post-processing LiDAR software or point cloud processing software to correct the data or bring it to Triple Business Center for goodness sakes. Um, you know, they rely on that. Um, and so you really have to know what you're doing. But like, for instance, right now we're having a, a, a V70 promotion or a LiveOx promotion, and not all these sensors are made the same. And so what I'm going to talk about here is how to take average data and, and bring it through a workflow to make it outstanding data. Uh, can't correct sometimes uh, IMU bias errors as freely, but we can correct a lot of the other intrinsic noises that show up. And by the way, every lighter sensor has noise, just some manufacturers are better at hiding it. So what I'm gonna show you is how when you do get your sensor, whether it's through us or somebody else, I don't care, uh, how, do, how do you make that good? Because I'm here to help you guys out. So the first thing you're gonna wanna look at, and, and by the way, as we, some of these topics or, or titles that we're gonna be talking about uh, may be routine to Green Valley, but the functions and, and what they do, and I'll try to explain this the best that I can, uh, are germane across the board. So the first thing, you know, is, you know, really about uh, the, the data calibration. So in Green Valley, they call it a boresight. And what that does is I pull this up really quickly, and I'm not going to go through all of it, uh, but it's going to look at 
whether it's rotational error or translational error, which is your X, Y mostly. Um, and so they call it a bore site because what they're doing is they're looking at the data set and they're adjusting strip to strip. So some th people call it strip matching um, to make subtle corrections into the data uh, that may be affected that day based on how, how it was mounted, the weather conditions, um, slight variances in calibration for the day. And so what Green Valley has done is said, hey, we're going to allow a, a data analytic followed by a data correction that you can use for all the flights for that day. So pretty powerful stuff. Uh, in my other video that I'm going to cover here a little bit later, uh, I'm going to actually go through this and, and show you analytically how this stuff actually is improved uh, using some of these techniques. And again, there's other folks on the market that have this. Um, so don't think this is just Green Valley. Uh, I'm just showing you through this interface. Okay, so once you get through a bore site, in the interest of time, is now we're going to do a, t a trajectory adjustment. Now it may be called something else. Um, like if you go through, let's say, Inertial Explorer, it's going to do some of that adjustment and give you a quality report. This is kind of back in the day where you can start to look at uh, the data quality of your rover as it moves through time and space. Um, but a lot of folks are now starting to do a secondary analysis on their telemetry um, to find errors. And I'll tell you, at least with the Green Valley one and some of the others, uh, this makes a big difference. Um, again, in the next video I'm going to do, I will show you how big of a difference this makes, but it's on the order of, uh, of centimeters, okay? Because, um, you know, like in my five, uh, five tips to LiDAR, we talked about IMU in integrity and how good that has to be. Um, you know, I have kind of reversed my position in that I can correct it with software. This is what we're talking about when we can correct it with software. So I can use a more affordable IMU and still get great data results as long as I know what I'm doing. And so by doing a trajectory adjustment, what we're looking at is the spleen and we're getting rid of um, statistical errors or, or average errors out there. And if I had a whiteboard, I'd show you, but you know, you'd have a series in a line and then you may have a data attribute that's way up here. And then it comes back into mark. We're gonna get rid of all those little uh, glitches that we may have both that are inertial based and GPS based. And that's what we're doing with trajectory adjustment. And by correcting that, that corrects all our LIDA data that's supported by it. Okay? All right. Now, the next thing as we get into these tools is, is cut overlap. And so to explain cut overlap, um, depending on the LIDAR sensor that you have, from strip to strip, you're going to have variances in how those strips align. Uh, depending if you're doing long lead times, some, some LiDAR sensors only want you, like I think a good one is the DJI L1, only wants you to, I think, fly in a straight line for 30 seconds. Guys, I got news for you. You're going to have to fly longer than that to actually be effective. Okay, so that's the difference between a tool and a toy. Now, still, you know, as you make those long straight lines and you're not putting in a lot of turn, you're going to get bias error. Okay, and as you come back around, yeah, you'll be doing an inertial correction. Um, that, that's why a turn is nice, as long as you're doing it correctly, and then you're going to come back. And so you're going to have subtle differences between the two, no matter how strong your IMU is. The other thing you may have is an angular error, especially with 360 sensors. So if you're collecting at 90 degrees and above, you're probably not sitting in a confidence interval, 90, or 95% confidence interval, because you're going to have subtle mismatches. I'll cover that again in my next video here um, so that you can see that. So a cut overlap, what that's going to do is it's going to look strip to strip and it's not going, well, you could delete and I'll pull this up here for you guys. So you can look at this and so we will look at this data uh, and right now it's on a classification scheme. We could delete it. I'm not a big fan of deleting until much later because I may be deleting attributes I might need depending on my use case. Um, but then I'm going to set up a series of parameters to say, hey, I have high confidence in this area right here and out here I want to judge it differently so that I can eliminate um, 
data that's that's going to a look fuzzy when I merge it all together uh, so that I have a consistent surface or a consistent ground under my vegetation. All right, and again, I'll show you that in my next video. So hang in there if you if you really want to learn this stuff. All right. Um, so with that uh, going in here is good. The next thing is uh, removing outliers, and you can see there's lots of other little tools in here. Um, you know, and again, everybody has these to some degree. Uh, the remove outliers is to be perfectly honest, it, it's denoising. Okay, and this data set, let me close this again real quick. When you look at it, this is really clean. Uh, I'm looking just from a side view, and I'll put it into height profile. And, and you can see there's there's very little noise. There's a little noise under here. Um, there was actually a, apparently a fire when they did this downwind. Uh, so they had a little bit of smoke, but not bad. Um, so by running that, we can get rid of that, that little bit of noise so that when we do deliver our, our lighter point cloud, uh, that stuff's gone and we don't have to do, you know, extensive, uh, extensive filter and editing here. So that's why you want that. Every LiDAR sensor is going to have some form of noise. Don't let a guy tell you that it's not. Um, you know, there's just little things in the atmosphere, uh, reflectance on your drone, uh, sometimes sun, uh, sun reflectance. There's a lot of different things that can give you noise. Uh, along the way and so you want to remove those data artifacts whether it's high noise or low noise if you're ARSPS certified uh, which means how far away that noise is from uh, your data set uh, you need to get that corrected okay all right and the last thing here uh, I'm going to put in here is and I don't use it in this tool in generally but is an elevation adjustment and so you can load a correction table in uh, I cover this more in our data course uh, but what that allows us to do is shift up or down the data set to remove bias error and, and snap it to grid. Okay, that's important, folks, because you will have subtle errors that are going to deviate um, because you are going from GPS. Ground control always corrects it to ground truth. So the better your survey is, the better your data is going to be. You want that in there or you're going to want to add that to your workflow later on and I, I usually do that in another program as I do my entire project but I like having it here uh, because it quickly goes through um, and corrects that those data sets okay now now that we've talked about data conditioning the next thing I want to talk about is quality checks so it's great that you're processing through and if, but if you talk to any survey or engineer out there the other thing uh, that you're going to want to do is have confidence in the data that you're going to be presenting. And so you're going to want to be able to have to inspect it. So the first thing is being able to view in different um, different uh, modalities or different ways of viewing it. So right now we're in height mode and I'll turn on basically the shadow. And the shadow just allows me to outline all the points so that features stand out. This is Tundra, so it's not overly exciting here guys um, but you can see you can see my noise being stuck out here which is cool um, but you can also see my terrain uh, the other thing I like is being in intensity view uh, intensity view will first tell you the quality of the, the sensor that you're dealing with it helps you with classification um, and it's based on reflectance and you can see some slight overlap mismatch which we'll fix in data quality in the next video um, but here now I can, I can really kind of judge how things are working. Um, this one has a classification view, so I can look at like my strip match and, and stuff like that. Uh, RGB, which again, I'll show you, I'll do an overlay here to show you what that looks like. You know, and then we can look at, you won't see very much here, but oh yeah, you will. Um, so we can look at different rates of return. Most of this is first return, um, but we can go ahead and eliminate some of this. Okay, there's second return, and there is a little bit of third return under that bush right there. Uh, again, not a good case to actually show this, but um, but yeah, you can see where second and third return. And I'll, I'll tell you what, if people put another comment they want to see how returns are done, or more importantly, how it impact, I'll, I'll get a couple pieces of data and show you what that looks like. Uh, and why it's important. Uh, this is just not the data set to look at that for. All right, so 
yeah, being able to have those uh, side views is important. Um, I'm going to go back to height model view. Um, reason being is I can also start to change point size. So if you're in compare cloud or some of those others uh, for viewing, this is important because now I can see where my data attributes are above and below to see how well my data is actually doing. So sometimes it's important to change point size. All right. The other thing that I think is an invaluable tool, and let's go snap back to top view. There we go. Um, is I'm going to use the profile tool. And so when I'm doing quality inspection, and I'm going to I'm going to change this parameter to 0.5 centimeters, and I'm going to pull out the profile tool, and I'm going to try to find the best bare earth that I can. Uh, there we go. And the nice thing I like here is I can do a strip to strip look, so I can colorize these based on strips. And then I can start to really get in. Ah, here we go. So you can see we've got some misalignment here. And I'll show you in the next video how to correct that. Uh, but this is why you want to take a look at this from a data quality perspective. Uh, I want to know how well this is, this is blending in. I want to know how well my strip match is. Why? Um, it's because this actually is going to affect the overall quality and accuracy of my data. The higher my precision is, the better I'm going to be. So that's why we're doing some of these data conditioning pieces here, is so that I can inspect the precision and make the right prescription or adjustment to this to get the best results possible. All right, on here. So that's why I have this. That's why I like this on here. Uh, this is important. Um, you know, and then the last thing is getting into reports. So. You know, for instance, in this particular case, I can do the trajectory. I can pull up a report. Uh, oh, I didn't run it. Well, I can pull up reports, and I'll, I'll pull some of those out to show you um, on here later on. But um, that way, you know, when you're when you're back, you can have that on file, and you can see those uh, persistent adjustments. I'll include that in that next video that talks about how to improve your data quality. Um, I know I keep saying I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you it, either in the link that I keep on popping up at the top here or I'll have a link down below to get to that video uh, and I'll re release that the next day. Okay, so this has been a long video. The last thing I'm going to share with you guys is as a bonus it is um, what I really like about Green Valley that I haven't seen in any of the desktop software uh, that I know of um, is classification. So this is something new from Green Valley. Uh, I'll pull it up in my settings. Uh, but in my workflow, I can go ahead and start to add classification in here. Why is that important? Man, is it really nice to have your ground broken out before you go over. Now, you know, you still want to do your quality control checks on this stuff, folks. But being able to have that 90% of the way done before I had to do my cleanup, whether I go into you know, Global Mapper or Terra Solids or, or Trimble Business Center and do my clip and clean. Um, that is really nice to have as a workflow element. So this is kind of my little bonus. Really impressed with that. All right. So folks, I hope this really has helped you. Um, you know, in, in my LiDAR journey, I've watched LiDAR tools get better and better. And so I'm really excited that I could share uh, the overall things that I look for. I'm excited that I could actually show you on LiDGeo, and I, I can't wait. I'll get Chris to actually do a video on some of the other software so that you have a comparison you get to see side by side. And it also keeps my vendors happy because they all are putting out great products for you guys out there. Um, I'll also leave you with a quick, you know, we are having a promotion right now. Um, so for the next few days, we're going to have a promotion on the V70. You'll get this software. Uh, along with a 24 megapixel camera integrated to the V70, and we're selling it at uh, 16.5. That is lower than a L1 right now with its data set. And why are we doing that is we are moving that along to get ready for uh, a new uh, lighter coming out. It's still LiveOx, it's still gonna have a camera, but it has a few features that are nice to have. Um, and so I've been asked to help you guys out and promote the V70 just a little bit longer. Um, if you would like to wait till the next one comes out, that is fine. But if you would like something that would cash flow um, very, very quickly, it's going to be accurate unlike the L1. Um, I'm gonna make that offer. I'll put that link down on the bottom while it's still active, okay? 
if you like this, you know, go ahead and subscribe. You know, get the notifications because I'm going to be putting out more and more of this content, the no bull content. Um, and uh, if you want to see something, leave a comment. Those are important. That tells me what you care about so that I can get you the information that you want and that you're looking for. With that, you know, uh, I'll see you in the next video, which I keep on saying is going to be the accuracy, uh, showing you how to get the accuracy out of a Livox sensor. All right, with that, I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.